Romans 8. So if you turn in your Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then the Romans. Letter to the Romans, chapter 8. passage of scripture about spiritual victory, the beginning of Romans, really establishes very plainly the need of all men for salvation. Romans 1, 2, 3, 4 explains why it is that all men will answer to God for whether or not they trust Christ for their salvation. And we see the difference between the Jews and the Greeks and the way that God has used the Jews and the Greeks to answer a lot of questions about the church. The church is not the same as Israel, but salvation has always been through Jesus Christ. And then we saw very plainly laid out in chapters 3 through 6 what salvation is and what really is required in order to be saved. And that's where we learn many of the verses that are in the Romans Road plan for salvation. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And those passages of Scriptures are there. And then we find the un illogical man's fleshly conclusion that because sin is abounding and grace is much more abounding than sin, then the natural conclusion is that it brings God the glory and makes grace abound for us to sin. And of course, the Bible's words about that are, Big time no, meganoite, or God forbid, no way, absolutely not. That's bad logic. And we see that the response to that kind of thinking is to get our thinking straight. And so we see several times the word reckon used. The word reckon means to think, to count, or to uh, just mark it down. You think this way. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 7 goes through the discourse on the law and the flesh and how it is that we are able to be freed from the law of sin, the consequences of sin and the consequences of obedience to the flesh and the means for victory. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the means for salvation and friend, He's also the means for victory. It is not Jesus plus you, my friend. It is Jesus. And that is the means for our salvation, the means for victory. And then we see a conditional statement or a statement that has a condition in order for it to be true. And that is that there is therefore now no condemnation to, those, to them which are in Christ Jesus. And the condition is, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we find a common theme that is always in the context of spiritual victory, and that is the same as we find in Galatians chapter 5. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not obey the lust of the flesh. You have trouble spiritually? You have trouble with sin in your life? Friend, I promise you, you are not doing well spiritually if you're having trouble with sin. And if you're, having, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're not having trouble with sin. They're contrary to each other. To obey one is to disregard the other. To disregard the one is to obey the other. You can't serve two masters, and that's what we've seen. And so the Bible solution, the cure for defeat in the life of a Christian is to be spiritual. Well, pastor, you know, that's a very simple command. How is it that we can walk in the Spirit? Friend, get along with God. Spend time with God. Commune with the Spirit of God and you'll be walking in the Spirit. You know, we've made that so complicated. Uh, Pastor, you're always saying walk in the Spirit. Well, how do I walk in the Spirit? Get in God's Word. Go to God in prayer. Fellowship with God. Talk to God. Listen to God. Ask God. Pray to God. Spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be Spirit-filled. God's Spirit is where you are communing with Him. And so go to the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're struggling in victory, you know, this is the question I always ask somebody that's struggling. Hey, did you read your Bible today? And sometimes, well, yes. Well, they always say yes because they've always read their Bible on the day they know they're going to come to me and tell me they've got problems. And so they can say they read their Bible. But it's, uh, are you in fellowship with the Lord? Have you taken care of sin in your life? And the answer to that usually is no. Did you read your Bible enough today? Did you spend enough time in the Word of God? Did you spend enough time in fellowship with God? 
Are, are things really right between you and God? Or is it one of these, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Amen. And you go about your day and you don't mean a thing about what you're saying. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to you. And Christian, I want to tell you something. God is a real person. And you try talking to any person casually or flippantly or with a remote or a uh, just a uh, rote prayer and see how they respond. You know, somebody asks me how they're doing. I hope that they want to know how I'm doing. Somebody says hello to me. I hope they're saying hi. You know, but most many times... Uh, we get frustrated, don't we, by somebody who just processes us? You ever feel processed when you go to, to the store and you want to order something? Can I take your order? And uh, what was it somebody told me yesterday? No, I'd like to be polite. I would like to give you a request <laughs> or whatever. You know, I don't generally order people around at the, at the store. No. See, you want somebody to be real. But you ever had somebody just give you the speech? Somebody calls you on the phone, hello, how are you today? Da 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 It doesn't matter if you respond or not. They're going to keep on going whether you do or not. And it's just a speech and, and nobody's talking to you. That's how we treat God many times. The fact of the matter is that God loves you and He knows you by name. When he, Jesus died on the cross, He died specifically for the sins that you have committed. And God is very aware of you. Christ is very aware of you on the cross. And so you matter to God. He knows you and He knows what your problems are. It's not one of these generalizations. You don't have a general relationship with God. You have a specific relationship with God and you've got to be honest with Him. So there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Last, the last two weeks we have looked at the benefits of suffering and some of the, uh, I guess, the hope in suffering. And one of the things we looked at specifically in the last couple of weeks is that... Uh, Last week was that we're saved by hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And so the reminder that when we suffer, it gives us a view of heaven. When we suffer, it takes our eyes off of the things that are unimportant and, and really give us a goal of a place that is free of suffering. And so one of the benefits of suffering is that we have the hope of heaven. Another benefit of suffering is that we have the help of God's Spirit. God's Spirit lives in us. He makes intercession for us. And it's a demonstration that we are the adopted children of God. And so we have the help in suffering. And then we uh, saw also that we have the opportunity to see God take that which in the world's eyes is not good, and God to work it for good with the qualification, the condition that we love God. And then the last thing that we saw as a benefit is that we see God's purpose in our lives. Suffering many times gives us a clear view of heaven, shows us the hope and the help, and it shows us uh, that uh, God is with us, but one of the great benefits of suffering is it really helps us to align our purpose. It's amazing how scatterbrained we can be in life sometimes. Boy, we're off chasing this dream and that dream and going this direction and that direction. And sometimes suffering gets you to the place where you need to see God's hand and then you see God's call in your life. And thank God for the things that He has brought into our lives that help us to be single-minded. Okay, now, verse 28 is where we'll pick up our text this evening. And we're going to read uh, a bunch of, uh, they're not really rhetorical questions this evening, but a, a, a list of questions, and we'll just look at those this evening and the conclusion. So let's read verses 28 all the way down to verse 39. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For... Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now we're going to look at the passage that we're going to focus on this evening. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, 
in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing, creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you want a title for the message this evening, it is the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the theme this evening, and we're going to look tonight at the love of God and the benefits of the love of Christ. God, thank you tonight for Jesus. Lord, we know that the answer to everything in life is Jesus Christ. God, we know that the answer to everything for eternity is Jesus Christ. And I ask that you would help us to be simple-minded and single-minded about this truth and help us to get it in our heads how important our Savior is in all things. And Lord, we ask that tonight He might have the preeminence. And Lord, above and beyond that, we ask that you would help us to see Jesus in the place that He deserves in our lives. And God, help us to keep Him there. And help us to change our mind and to reckon ourselves the right way according to who Jesus is. We pray in His name. Amen. Well, of course, we see a couple of promises that uh, it's interesting. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 9 are uh, ripped and torn from the overall context of Romans in most studies. Most of the time you look at a passage or a book that is a commentary or is going to do a study on Romans. Romans chapter 1 through 7 are tossed into the trash can. In other words, it'll be like, well, there's a whole lot of material in Romans chapter 1 through 7 and, you know, a little bit of material up to chapter 8. But in chapter 8 and verse 28, we find out uh, that we're predestinated to be saved. And you say, Pastor, it's oversimplification. No, friend, that's just what most commentaries want to talk about. They want to argue about whether or not God determined before we were born whether we were predestined to heaven or to hell. And the fact of the matter is, if you just read, beginning in Romans chapter 1, you see that God's Word is very clearly laying out a lot of doctrinal, scriptural truth, one, about our salvation. But salvation is not being explained in Romans chapter 8. Our salvation was discussed far previous to that in this passage of Scripture. And the question was asked in chapter 2, what about the Jews and what about the Gentiles? Here the church at Rome is a mixed church. They're a very largely Gentile church, but they've also got a large Jewish constituency. And so the, the church has a lot of questions. Are we, are we a Jewish religion? Is... Has Israel been replaced and cast away? And we're about to see the answer to that in chapter 9. Chapter 9 through the rest of the book are all about Israel and her place and her future. And all about the place that the church has. And so if you just read the Bible and you just toss away commentaries. Preacher friend I was talking to today actually told me, he said when he was in seminary, he said they came to Romans chapter 8 and he divided the class in half and he said, I want everybody on this side to read a bunch, to read these books. And he gave a list of books and to study them on Romans 8 and 9. And he said, and they're, uh, they're from a point of view of an Armenian. And he said, I want everyone on this side of the class over here to read a bunch of books. And they're from a Calvinist point of view and he said we're going to come back next week and we're going to look at what we've what we've each of us have learned and um, he raised his hand the, the man didn't and he realized you know you, you don't teach the teacher but she raised his hand he just asked the question he said sir aren't we supposed to look at the bible first are we supposed to know what the bible says first he says you know you're right cancel that go to the bible and find out about romans chapter 8 and chapter 9 you know what if you do that you'll never come down believing that god predetermines the outcome of eternal souls without their having any kind of a choice in it and you'll find out that no person has the right to take his salvation upon himself and is responsible for his own salvation and can also reject his salvation at a later date it's not taught anywhere in the scripture neither of those viewpoints both of those viewpoints come from tainted um, a corrupted doctrine and from a corrupted doctrinal history that follows men. Calvin was a follower of men. And I'm glad for the way that uh, that uh, maybe that John Calvin was saved. I'm glad for his coming out of a mess. But friend, he came from Roman Catholicism and it was his point of reference. And, I'd, and Calvin was never a Bible believer in the sense that we're Bible believers. So you say, Pastor, I don't know if I agree with that. Study John Calvin. Don't study John Calvin. Don't waste your time on studying John Calvin. Uh, but Calvin was a follower of Augustine. And uh, Augustine, you can just go and trace it back and back and back. And when you follow men, you'll come up with something entirely different than what the Bible teaches. 
Romans 8, 28 and 29 plainly delineate that what we are predestinated to is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Those that are called. How many people are called? Everybody. All men are called. And uh, who are the elect? In this context, Israel is the elect and the saved are the elect. You get elected by responding to your call. But the Bible clearly teaches, and in Romans teaches, that God's called all men to be saved. Those that are elected are those who have responded to the call to be saved. But the Bible teaches here that these individuals are not called to salvation. That is not the context. The context here is that we're predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And I wish, instead of debating and arguing and acting like a bunch of fools that don't care whether or not people go to heaven or go to hell, but they just care about exalting their own intellect, I wish people would be concerned about their calling to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of your predestination. God's predetermined outcome in the life of every person who's ever been saved is that you become exactly like Jesus Christ. That's your calling as a believer, and you're predestinated to it. You say, Pastor, well, uh, if that's what I'm predestinated for, then it doesn't look like my predestination is doing me very much good. It doesn't look like it to me either, but someday you'll be in heaven and you'll be perfect. I just slammed you. Did you catch? Okay. <laughs> I've been throwing insults out from the pulpit just for fun, so you can say the same thing to me, and it won't hurt me any. I was just saying if you're paying attention this evening. But the fact of the matter is that whether or not you are actively becoming conformed to the image of Christ or not, that is what God has predetermined for you to be. And someday you're going to be in a place when you will have the righteousness of God not only on you positionally, but you'll no longer be a sinner. Amen. And you will be in the image of Jesus Christ. That's absolutely amazing. And the wonderful thing about that is, again, this doctrine of even footing. Even footing. There's no advantage here to the Jew. There's no advantage to the Greek. We are all predestinated to be like Jesus. So don't compare yourself to each other. Compare yourself to Jesus Christ because that, my friend, is your final outcome. Isn't it encouraging to know that there's not any super Christians here that you can't keep up with in spiritual growth? The fact of the matter is that there are no individuals here that are on equal ground with Jesus Christ, but He is our standard. So Christ's likeness is the goal of every Christian. It is God's predetermined outcome, so don't tell me you can't do what God's called you to do. You're called according to His purpose, and His purpose is that you're predestinated to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Thank God for suffering that accomplishes that in your life. Now, looking ahead uh, in verse 31, we see some questions in conclusion to the fact that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the Spirit, or after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's our context. That's our conclusion. And now here are some follow-through questions regarding the matter. First of all, what shall we then say to these things? What things? Well, this whole matter of infirmities, this whole matter of circumstances that come into our life. What are we going to say to them? What's our answer going to be when we're faced with trouble? So this evening, ask yourself the question, what is going to be my answer? when I face the circumstances that God has called me to be a part of in order that I can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? What will be the answer? What should we say to these things? Well, here's what we say. I can do it. I can do it. If God be for us, who can be against us? Pastor, I can't do it. Quit your whining and thank God for victory that's in Jesus Christ. Pastor, it's impossible. You don't understand my background. You don't understand my training. You don't understand how difficult my circumstances are. If God be for us, who can be against us? And the answer is, who can stand against God? No one. No one. It's not a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question that's not meant to be answered. This is a question that answers itself. If God be for us, who can be against us? No one. No one. If God be for us, what can be against us? Nothing. If God be for us, what can stop us? Nothing. Christian, did you know that you are, and I'm not speaking motivational speaking or uh, motivational thinking this evening, I'm just telling you the facts, nothing can stop you. 
You are an unstoppable force because you represent Jesus Christ. You're being conformed to Christ. You're on your way to heaven and you're going to get there and nobody can keep Jesus from taking you there. Amen. That's our destination. And you can't be stopped. Hey, listen, you can lock Pastor Price up and you can put him in a dungeon anywhere in the world and it won't stop him from getting to heaven. You can't stop me because Christ has paid the penalty for my sin. He has guaranteed my victory. My calling is to be conformed to His image. And I am an unstoppable force because God is with us. He's ever seen the little God is my co-pilot sign? And then the answer to that or the response to that, um, God is my pilot sign. The fact of the matter is that it doesn't matter how you want to phrase that. God's with me. God is with me, Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus Christ, the indwelling Christ, the God's Spirit, is God with us. And friend, who can stop God? And the answer is no one's ever done it. Never been done, and it cannot be done. Hey, listen, God can call you to the most dangerous of places, and you are invincible because God is with you. God can call you to the most desolate of locations and you are not alone because God is with you. If God be for us, who can be against us? No one, nothing, no circumstance. And then it goes on to say this, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Luke chapter 11 explains it this way. It talks about if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? God is a good God. And the, the scenario we find laid out here is if the, the individual that spared not his own son, in other words, you say, God didn't spare his own son, then I'm in a lot of danger myself. No, friend. What we see in God's not sparing his own son is not that God judged his son for his son's sin. He spared not His own Son in the place of our sin. In other words, this is a love statement of the Bible. This is not a threat for chastisement. This is a demonstration of God's love. If God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, do you see this? That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life, then friend, God loves you! It's a love statement. He that spared not His own Son for some strange reason, loved you enough to allow His Son to die. You cannot state more emphatically the love of God than to state that God's sinless Son died for your sin so that you would not be judged, but that He would be judged in your place. He that loved you enough to judge His innocent Son. We cannot understand, we cannot fully comprehend that great of love. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God, can I say that again? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son in exchange for you. This is not a trade on the basis of equality. This is not, you've got value, and so we'll swap. This is, I love you. And this is the evidence. This is the proof. There's no return on an investment in kind when the investment is the blood of Jesus Christ. We value ourselves. We think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think many times. The fact of the matter is that the value of a Christian is the inestimable, inestimable value of the blood of Jesus Christ. The fact that God gave His Son and God judged His Son to demonstrate His love to you. And the question then is, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? God loved you enough to save you. Do you think He might love you 
enough to take care of you? Amen. It is absolutely mind-bogglingly, that's a good word, ludicrous, that God would send Christ to die for your sins and then do nothing more. I suppose if uh, one of us were wealthy enough to buy this stupid little Nissan car that they've got. It looks like a little box, but they've put a hot rod motor in it, and it's like 600-something, this 500-something horsepower is going to be like more than that when they make it, and they're going to make a run of 20 of them. And people are paying 500-something thousand dollars for these cars. Now, supposing that any of you had $500,000, and, and probably most of you do, uh, supposing that were so, but that was all you had, and you were to purchase one of those cars. Supposing you valued one of those cars enough to make the investment of everything you've got, which is $500,000, would you take care of that car? Or would you let Brother Chris drive it? <laughs> I know you're generous people, but he spilled bleach on my great-grandmother's 71 Chevelle carpet. He dropped a toolbox on the hood of my Toyota pickup right after I'd gotten it painted. And I wouldn't even let him look at it. But I love Brother Chris. <laughs> Proof of it is that he messed with my Chevelle and we're still friends. So don't doubt it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is if you value something enough to give the most precious even everything that you've got. It's ludicrous to think that you'd park it in the middle of the street and let it rust. You take care of it. And God values you. God loves you. So much so that Christ died for your sins and He'll take care of you. Amen. He's called you. He's got a purpose for you. Your purpose is to be conformed to the image of Christ and God's going to help you do it. He's going to get you there. He's going to give you His grace, His power, His ability. And this is an exceeding great and precious promise. This is a wonderful thing that is the result of there not being condemnation to them that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. They're the ones that are in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 33 then. Can you be stopped? Can somebody bring something against you that will stop God's purpose in your life? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And a simple statement, it is God that Dick Iasunes. The word justifieth is a word for righteous. And it literally is righteouses, if you want it in the English. When you were justified, you were righteous. In other words, God righteous you. You didn't <coughs> stop sinning. You didn't uh, turn over a new leaf. You literally were made to be righteous by God's power. And God's power was the justifying blood of Jesus Christ. It was the cross of Calvary. It was the once for all payment for sin. And the question is, when God righteouses you, who can unrighteous you? Who can say, throw this on them, and now they're condemned and the answer is not a single person in the world because when God justifies, it's a permanent job. Amen. It's done. <clears throat> Who can lay anything to the charge of God's effect? Now you heard, heard that. Don't judge, you can't judge me. Or in the redneck vernacular, you don't know me, you can't judge me. Uh, the fact of the matter is it's God that's the judge. It's God that's the judge. And God judged Jesus for you. No one else can do that. 
There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So there's no condemnation in the life of a Christian. Then it goes on to say, Who is he that condemneth? And what's the answer to that question? Who is he that condemneth? It's not a man. It's not an angel. It's not a satanic angel. It's not the Satan himself. It is God that is able to condemn. And it is Christ that died who was condemned. Yea, rather that is risen again. Don't you love this? Who's able to condemn? God condemned Jesus to die for our sins. And immediately when that statement is made, Jesus is risen. In other words, Christ rose again. All the implications of that we saw in chapter 6. Being baptized not only in the, with the death of the Lord Jesus, being buried, our sins being buried with the Lord Jesus, but be risen with Jesus Christ. And we are not simply figuratively, we're not just as a matter of identification risen. Friend, we are in fact as risen as Christ is. We are as alive as Christ is alive. And that is a big deal. That matters a great deal. You see, the fact is that Jesus died for sins that were actually committed. And I know I've said this many times lately, but we've got to get this in our understanding and develop our thinking on the basis of it. Jesus didn't die for virtual sins. He died for actual sins. He didn't virtually die. He physically died. He wasn't figuratively judged by God. He was actually condemned by God for things that you and I have actually done. And if Jesus physically died for things that we have physically done, friend, then our payment is paid for. Amen. It's really paid for. And if Jesus really was risen again, and He was, then we're really risen again. And we are. And this is wonderful. It's a wonderful truth. We're alive. If Jesus is alive and I'm saved, so am I. Amen. So am I. He's making intercession for us. Verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here are some scenarios. Tribulation. Hard times. Can hard times separate us from the love of Christ? God, where are you in this? Friend, you never need to ask that question. Tribulation can't separate you from the love of God. Distress. God, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. There's no, I have no idea. Has God's calling in your life become less? Has His purpose for you gone away? Is God separated from you somehow in distress? And the answer is no, He's with you. There is no distress. Persecution. God, I'm persecuted for your sake all the day long. I'm led as a sheep to the slaughter. As, hey, wait, that was Jesus that was persecuted. Does God know about persecution? Yes. Famine. God, my needs aren't met. Do you need more than Jesus? Nakedness. Is your covering... With the blood insufficient? Peril. Are you on the sea being tossed with the winds and the waves and the Savior cannot walk on water? Sword. Can someone get to you that God cannot prevent? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day, the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. The question is, is any of these things going to separate us from the love of God? And the answer is nay. Nay. <laughs> what a statement. What a statement. In all these things, we're more than conquerors. Amen. In all these things, we're more than conquerors 
through Him that loved us. Can anything separate us from the love of God? No. All of these things simply come to the end that we're more than conquerors through His love. We win through the victory that's in Christ Jesus. <coughs> For I'm persuaded that neither death, Paul said, I'm convinced, that there's no doubt in my mind that neither death nor life nor principalities, <laughs> did Paul know a little bit about death, life, and principalities? Yes. Nor powers? Yes. Nor things present? Nor things to come? Nor height? Nor depth? Nor any other creature? shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that, if you will, is the other bookend. God is love. God is always love. And God is love. It's a love passage. And if Christ spared not His Son, God spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, shall He not with His own Son also freely give unto us all things? And the answer is yes. Christian, I stand before here you this evening to say to you, based upon the authority of the Scripture, that God is love. Very specifically, God loves you. And there's not a single thing in this life that can take away God's love, that can prevent God's love, that can hinder God's love, or can change God's purpose in your life, and His purpose is for you to be conformed to Jesus Christ. Pastor, I don't know what God has for me. I do. And I'm not even you. Seriously, you know, God's will in my life. I don't know where God's going to send me. I don't know what God's going to... I do. He's taking you to heaven, and He's going to make you like Jesus. It's God's purpose. You can try as hard as you want to to mess it up and it will cause you trouble, but God's love is not going to be dwindled or diminished in any means. God's love will not be thwarted. God's love will not be stopped. God loves you, and the proof of it is Jesus Christ. The real question is this, how are you living in light of the love of God? How are you living in light of the love of God? Does your daily living demonstrate that you know God loves you? And I'm not talking about, oh, my God is a God of love. God would never judge. No, friend, God judged His own Son. That's how much love God is. Oh, you don't talk about condemnation. No, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Oh, we don't want to preach a hellfire and brimstone gospel. You know, that, is, that turns people off. Friend, the love of God saves lives, saves souls for eternity. And it's not a turn off. But God did judge Jesus. And if you don't think that's pleasant, my friend, you have a misunderstanding about what you are in your trespasses and sins. The most precious thing in the world is God's judgment of His precious Son. I know it makes me want to turn away. It makes me shudder to think of the suffering that Christ accomplished in my place. But the beauty of it is that I am able to live because of it. And I don't know why it is that God loves me but I know God loves me. I don't understand why God would care enough to have a purpose for me, but I know God has a purpose for me. And the reason I know is because of Jesus. What do you know about Jesus? You know, this evening and you say, well, Pastor, I, uh, I know a lot about the Bible. The question is, do you know Jesus? You know, this evening you've been saved. You trust a Christ, you're saved. You say, I know a lot about Christian living. My friend, do you know about Jesus? Because Jesus is the demonstration of God's love. If you want to know what your purpose in life is, and you want to know how to have victory over sin, you want to know the way to accomplish the calling of being conformed to the image of Christ, you need to know Jesus. Intimately, personally, on purpose. And there's no person that knows Jesus that struggles with victory. You say, Pastor, you mean all saved people have victory? No, I mean all people that are in fellowship with the Lord Jesus have victory. Because there's victory in Christ Jesus. He accomplished it through the payment of His Son, or of His, of his life. He gave His life for our sin. And He accomplished our victory 
in reconciling us to God. And there's nothing left to be done. There isn't some incomplete, unfinished work. There simply is you getting on board. You know, it's too bad. It's too bad that today we're so into methods and means and programs and ways to accomplish God's work, but we're not really all that much into Jesus. It's amazing to me that somebody can get saved in like that. Change and have victory. You know how they do it? Jesus. For the first time in their life, they get a glimpse of their sin and what it is. And they see that it condemned Jesus Christ, but they see that God loved them enough for Jesus to die and that they had worth in the eyes of God. And that God loves them. God loves you. And He's done everything that you need for today, for tomorrow, for eternity. And if I can say so this evening on the authority of the Scripture, friend, you can make it and nothing can stop you because you've got Jesus. Heavenly Father, I ask you to help us to trust only Jesus. Lord, help us not to trust to our changing or turning over a new leaf or doing something different. But Lord, help us to trust what you have done. Lord, I ask you to teach us about this matter of fellowship. Lord, no person can be walking in the Spirit and commit sin and fail and not know your word, not know your will. Lord, if we're doing those things, it's because we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. And I ask you to show us that very clearly. Show us your love. Win us with your love. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll take prayer.